Good morning. Welcome back to our regularly scheduled programming in our church history series uh, for the adult Bible class. We're going to be taking a look at the Church of England and their theological development and the tool we're going to use to evaluate that is something known as the Book of Common Prayer. And as I was reflecting this morning about the lesson, I, I realized that it's, it's possible to consider this Reformation bloodless and cold and dispassionate and to miss the fervency and the zeal of men like the Oxford Three, Thomas Cranmer and Hugh Latimer and um, and, I, and I hate for that to be missed. But if we're going to make it through church history without being history, <laughs> somewhere along the way we got to, you know, miss a few things. And so I encourage you to take a look at some of the resources that I've included with this lesson to get some of the more details of the people that are involved. But I really want to... Uh, get on the bloodline of the historical development of Baptist churches. And so it's important for us to kind of stay on that track. If you like to know, you know, the history of Presbyterianism in America, then I would encourage you to check out W. Robert Godfrey's church history series from Reformed Theological Seminary. If, you know, you wanted to uh, get the Catholic version, you can find that. So uh, anyhow, we're going to be taking a look at that, and that is our topic for today. I have a quote here uh, from the Act of Supremacy of 1549. It says, the book of the common prayer, actually this is their title, and administration of the sacraments and other rites and ceremonies of the church after the use of the church of England. And so you can see right away in the language, they talk about sacraments, you can hear the Catholic connection uh, to that. There are two handouts, yeah. Yep, and I, I didn't uh, keep any for myself, but um, I, I know what they are. So we're still here in Anglican Reform. We're going to move forward uh, on the fourth Sunday of the month by hearing from Andy and Williams teaching about the spread of Christianity in South America. And so he is our, our preacher, guest preacher. They'll be here the Wednesday before that. Uh, we're going to have a little dinner and fellowship with them. We're going to hear about their plans, their upcoming plans for getting back on the mission field in Colombia. And then he is uh, a guest speaker that morning on the 28th. And so he's going to also teach this church history class. So we had a special last time with the Quartodeciman controversy and we're going to be fat back off of our regular scheduled programming for special programming on the fourth Sunday of the month with Andy Williams. So he is extremely excited to dig into that and to present that uh, to you. And hopefully you find that um, refreshing and encouraging. I was just talking with Dawn this morning uh, at, at our you know morning coffee, and, and I was saying how interesting it is that you frequently have people with last names, Hispanic last names, like Evangelista, right, or Bautista, right, which is Baptist and Evangelist. You f find that it's a common name in, in Hispanic communities to have Jesus, right? But it, it would be weird to meet a British person with the name Jesus Evangelist, right? Like that That would kind of... So, so how is that... Um, you know, cultural normalcy for things like that? You know, how does their history of being Christianized make that more of a regular part of their culture? And so I don't know if he'll answer that question in particular, but you all are very bright people, and I'm sure you'll be able to, you know, make that connection. Some reading resources, uh, Comfortable Words, Polity and Piety, and the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, Charles Heffing, The Book of Common Prayer, A Guide. I think that is the introduction that I have printed out for you. 
Uh, Jacobs Allen has a biography of the Book of Common Prayer, which kind of covers the theological changes that happened uh, on account or, or through the, the four main revisions of it. Uh, and Timothy Rosendale, Liturgy and Literature in the Making of Protestant Eng England. This was an interesting book because he uses the tools of literary analysis to um, view the history of the Anglican Church, uh, where the Book of Common Prayer was the most important document to the church through that period of time, even more so uh, than the Bible. The Book of Common Prayer actually had more printings than even the King James Bible did over this course of time. So pretty interesting resources. Uh, Gerald Bray, his uh, church history too, he goes through a lot of this history. Less, there's five lessons there, 8 through 12. Uh, Bruce Gore, uh, again, I, I put links in there for his lessons. Again, he does a, a really good job covering the details of the persons. Uh, and he has a little devotional at the end of each of his lessons and, and very good teacher. Um, much more detailed about the, the, the nuts and bolts of the history than we're looking at. We're considering more the the theological impact in this class. Uh, and Simeon Zoll, um, this one is more academic, um, and maybe don't put this on late at night. So, uh, but it, a lot of good information in there, also taught at Beeson Divinity School. Um, so we're going to be talking about three things. We're going to talk about unity, theology, and historical development. Uh, with the Book of Common Prayer being um, the, the base uh, lens that we're, we're considering this structure through. So let's pray and get into our lesson. Father, I ask today as we uh, consider the Reformation in England and the consequences to the British people of, uh, of that Reformation, of the impact here in the United States of uh, the Episcopalian Church and uh, the own development of, of Baptist churches and, and the interaction there and the, the birth of Puritanism and, and just so many things that uh, color our understanding of tradition, of how we read scripture, what passages we connect together, Lord, that uh, that we might have our um, minds enlightened and our, our hearts encouraged and our depth of love uh, for you and your sovereignty and history uh, encouraged and, and cherish these things uh, with a new depth from today's study. And I ask that uh, this be true because you're an infinite God who loves us and met us in real space and time and history. And I ask you to meet us here today, in Jesus' precious name. So, uh, a couple of quotes from Platten and Wood's Comfortable Words. He says, the Book of Common Prayer is unique among the worship books of Christendom in having become the touchstone for the ethos, and even for hundreds of years, the unity of Anglicanism. So in his evaluation, it is the Book of Common Prayer, which was the central document which combined or, or unified the, the church in England. And I want to compare that with Paul's letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. He says, I, pe I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did not baptize also the household. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, 
but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And so he goes on to talk in 1 Corinthians about the power of God demonstrated uh, through the word of God about the cross of God. And so, so Paul's point here to the Corinthian church is that it is uh, the gospel message, the truth, the truth of salvation in Christ and the pursuit of Christ, which should be unifying. Uh, and we're going to find that what, what is happening in the, the Anglican Reformation is that it is the structure and the form of worship of the church, the form of prayer, the form of church government, which is going to be used to try to establish this unifying principle. And so you have the, the uh, mega structure of the Church of England that's trying to maintain unity through the Church of England, trying to, to maintain this idea of having a common people uh, that, that have the same belief system uh, and, and that that uh, common people and that common belief are, are put together under a legitimate king. Uh, and, and that if, if that is true, if the king really is the, the, you know, called by God to be their leader and, you know, the head of their church, then that should work its way out and be observable as a common practice. Right? This is what Paul is arguing in Corinthians about the, the cross of Christ and the power of Christ crucified and the power of proclaiming the gospel. Well, they're making that connection in England to the legitimacy of the monarch being the head of the church. And so uh, there are people in the English Reformation who passionately desire correct theology, passionately desire correct forms of worship. The instrument they use is government. The tool they use is a uh, enforced set of liturgy that the people are legally required to follow. And so, so this, uh, it's, it reminds me very much as I was studying for it, and I, I couldn't find other people that had written about this, but when we look back at church history and we see the way the structure of Christendom changed after Constantine took over, very much matches with what happened to the Anglican church. You know, how, how should church buildings look? How should priests dress? Why should there be a priestly class in any case, right, as, as opposed to elders in the church? These sort of changes about the authority and, and, and secular authority being given to the church and um, those sort of, uh, of, not contamination, that's not the right word, but consequences of life in the church very much played out again in the life of the Anglican church. So Platten and Woods continue, they say, as a right... That, that talking about the practice of liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer, they say, as a rite, it ceases to be an external object. It draws the whole person into its meaning and shapes who we are. So they're pointing out the power of when you walk into the Hagia Sophia in Turkey, which for 1,500 years was the most impressive, beautiful, unbelievable building ever created by man that it was dedicated toward, well, for a thousand years, dedicated toward God. And then in 1492, it was taken over by the Muslims and dedicated toward Allah. Um, you feel a certain way when you walk in there. The, the, the sense of awe and holiness that you experience is elevated by the presence of where you are. When you hear that music and you see everybody standing together, worshiping together, you are drawn in and unified by that. And that power of community, that power of experience is what the Book of Common Prayer was seeking to harness under a doctrine that matched what the king and his preferred bishops believed. And we're going to see this Book of Common Prayer 
be uh, very Roman Catholic under Edward VI. Um, it's going to get discarded under Mary, who was Catholic, and then it's going to be brought back under Elizabeth and be far more um, Protestant, Reformed. Uh, and eventually under James, it's going it's, it's, uh, it's to take on a more Puritan sort of uh, feel to it. So uh, we're going to see this push and pull, and we're going to look con- specifically at the words and the process used for the Lord's Supper uh, described in the Book of Common Prayer to kind of illustrate that. And so unity um, is achieved, or, or the goal of unity is achieved by this Book of Common Prayer through uh, five characteristics of it. This was corporate worship, right? Everybody around all of England, around all of the British Empire, knew that the morning prayers that they were making were dedicated and, and, and given under the same passage of Scripture as every other gathering of the church in England across the whole empire. And when they gathered together for their afternoon orders... The, the passages of scripture that they read and the, the, the devotional that they heard and the prayers down to the very words that they corporately spoke matched across the... And so if you could imagine the prayers of the people going up, they would be in unison praying for the same thing to God and there was power in that. And it was observable as a public event. It wasn't just thought of as possibly happening Everybody did this out in the open. It was public, and it was, it was scripted. So you didn't have to have uh, creativity. You didn't have to um, you know, bring your own uh, idea. You didn't have to worry about saying the wrong thing or being misunderstood, right? Or, and, and then not wanting to share because you might have been misunderstood. It was, it was entirely scripted. So you, you, you know, played along and did your part, and it was in the common language of the people. Right, Much like the Bible was inspired in the common language of the people who heard the Bible, the Book of Common Prayer was not written to a kind of high level or in Latin language. It was in the people's English. Even the you know, common person with no particular education was able to understand what was being said. And then fifthly, it was mandatory. It was punishable by the government, if you did not go and participate, if you did not tithe, if you did not take communion at least once a year. So that's the idea of unity, of of how this book of common prayer was intended to bring together all of Christendom and uh, assure the legitimacy of the monarch and provide for a... uh, uh, social order. Now, what is the theology that is being revealed? What is the, what, when I, I use the word theology, what I'm trying to say is what did they try to express their understanding about God and his interaction with the world and our correct response to um, what's revealed and what God has done and, and required of people? And the way you know what is believed is that you can look at the way people behave. Right, we've, we've talked about this many, many times that uh, even down to your very salvation, the proof of your salvation is not that you said words. It is you are shown to be justified by your works, right? That's what James said of Abraham. You see that Abraham is justified by his works, okay? What are you seeing? You're seeing the justification of Abraham. What is the proof of Abraham's justification? It is his works. Now, what is the root of Abraham's justification? His faith, right? The works did not save him. The works showed him to be saved, right? Jesus said that. You will know what kind of tree it is by its fruit, right? By this, you will, they will know you are my disciples because you made a confession of faith? No, by your love for one another, right? So this is entirely consistent. 
And it, it, it's, it, you have to be careful not to misorder that. Um, you, one of the debates uh, recently is this idea of lordship salvation, where, where unless uh, Jesus is the Lord of your life, you aren't saved. And so now it, you are saying you're not saved by grace through faith. You're saved by lordship. And that is a misunderstanding of what is trying to be explained. What's trying to be explained is you are saved by grace through faith. And that is shown because you have the fruit of good works, the fruit of the Spirit on, on the backside of salvation. Right? Paul said in Romans chapter 10, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Right? We have to be careful not to footnote the confession part and ignore that. We have to be careful not to footnote the belief in your heart part and ignore that. Right? Both are true. And so in this case, we can look at this book of common prayer. We can see the way it describes how the people are to celebrate certain sacraments or is it an ordinance. And we can understand through that what is meant to be believed. And that was the purpose of writing it. The chief architect, uh, Thomas Cranmer, made this very clear. Again, going to the analysis by Platten and Woods, they say worship is part of the church's participation in the Trinitarian life of God, offered to the Father through the mediation of the Son and in the power and under the inspiration of the Spirit. You see that uh, the, the way that you are able to interact and, and, and live out your faith uh, is demonstrated in your worship. And unique to the Church of England at this time was they made a separation about what is, the, um, what is Scripture good for? Right? What, is, what is the point of the Bible? And they would say that if you want to understand what is necessary for salvation and how you should live out your life, the, the, the moral values, that, the, the virtues that make for a good person, that is what the Bible describes. But the Bible gives the authority to the structure of the church, the form of worship of the church. Uh, they give that to how has the church developed over time? Right, we've talked about in this class before the argument of the cornerstone, the cornerstone argument. I'll remind you of that. Uh, you know, Jesus said, I am the stone that the builders rejected. And Paul said that Christ is the cornerstone upon which the church is built. So then the argument is made that whatever has happened in church history, if God is really sovereign, that is what God wanted the church to do. So by having a you know, head bishop, like the Bishop of Rome or the Archbishop of Canterbury in the case of the Church of England, and then, you know, subordinate bishops, although in the Church of England, they don't hold authority apart from their teaching and their theology. They can't hire and fire uh, churches over different parishes. But they can say what you're saying is right is not right, and it doesn't comport with this unity of churches. So, uh, that's something I learned in this study was that the structure is not exactly the same in the Church of England as it is in the Church of Rome. But they say that, and then, and then human reason. God gave us reason. Practicality, we see all the way back into uh, the, the letters of Polycarp as he's being brought to Rome to be martyred. He talks about, you know, what is an encouragement for the church and, and how should they honor their bishops as the head of multiple churches and and that you know that structure was very practical and it allowed for there to be a relationship between the church and the state and there is some truth to that right even as faith baptist church we deal with lawyers and banking and uh, the voting people that come in and insurance companies, right? Somebody has to sign as the authorized signature for those things. And, and when we do that, we have to kind of follow the rules of the governed state of Virginia, right? Or in the county of Allegheny and the you know, federal government of the United States because they don't know how to understand 
what we might understand as a biblical structure. So, so there is going to be that interaction. They say that, that all of that, that is um, given to the king as the, as the defender of the faith, as the, the head of the church. Now, when Elizabeth came to the throne, the, they could not make her the, the head of the church because man is the head of woman, Christ is the head of the state. A woman can't be the head of the church, so she became the governor of the church. So they did change the language a little bit because she was the legitimate monarch, according to their understanding. So all of that is introductory <laughs> and precursor to, uh, to understand the historical development. On the 21st of January, 1549, the legislature of England gathered together and under the advice of the counselors of King Edward VI um, and the king himself, who was, I think, 13 or 14 years old, uh, they passed this law called the Act of Uniformity, which, quote, dictated all ministers in the king's dominions were to use the new forms exclusively. Penalties for using other forms or failing to use the new form or openly derogating it range from a 10-pound penalty to life in prison and forfeiture of all property. So they're kind of serious about this, right? Like uh, uh, you are either going to worship according to the Book of Common Prayer or um, be in prison for life and lose all of your property. So how did we get there? Well, to begin with, you have to understand a little bit that the government of England at this time is not the same as the way England is governed today. Today, England has two houses, two representative houses, a House of Lords and a House of Commons, and they have the monarch, and the monarch uh, basically appoints a prime minister, and he is the head of state, but he doesn't get involved in any of the government. Well, the monarch was much more involved in governing at this time. The monarch called the legislature to order in order to basically tax the people so that he can do what he wanted to do. That's a little bit simplistic, but and then when they were done passing the laws he wanted to pass, he would disband the legislature and he'd say, okay, you guys are done, go home. So they couldn't meet of their own volition and they couldn't continue meeting of their own volition. It was all at the will of the monarch. Now, by the 1640s, this was going to change under Charles uh, because Charles, that's a, that's a later lecture. Just, just know that the, the Puritans get into Parliament later on and they decide we're going to make the changes we want, whether the king wants it or not. And you get things like the long Parliament and the king running for his life and uh, hiding his family because he's worried they're going to get murdered and, you know, th things like that. So uh, at this time, though, King Henry VIII had called together the legislature in order to pass certain laws that allowed him to get an annulment, to get remarried. We've rehearsed some of this history before. Henry dies, his son, Edward, through um, uh, Gray, what was her first name? Um, Lady Gray, yeah. Uh, so uh, the only surviving son... Edward the sixth becomes king. He's kind of sickly. He he has um, a very uh, reformed Protestant upbringing. the The head of the ministry under King Henry was a man by the name of Thomas Cranmer. Now Thomas Cranmer could not openly change views on the Lord's Supper, on baptism, on um, the sacrament of confession, about the authority of priests, because King Henry did not want any of that. King Henry just really wanted to divorce himself from the Pope's authority and make himself the authority, but he wanted everything else to be consistent with Roman Catholicism. That was Henry's belief system. Now, Thomas Cranmer did not 
think that way. Cranmer had been educated in mainland Europe. He knew guys like John Calvin. So what did Thomas Cranmer do? Thomas Cranmer played the long game. He taught Edward's son, or Henry's son, Edward, hey, this is really how it's supposed to be. All right, so by the time the Book of Common Prayer comes out, there's a much more, um, still very Roman Catholic, but much more Reformed uh, view to it. This, this 1549, it only lasted for like two years uh, before it gets revised, but uh, it dictated the order of service, uh, the annual calendar, what are the different saints' feast days that happen. Uh, and, and it kept certain things, like the word mass. Uh, the, the principal thing that they aimed to do was that they did not want the Lord's Supper to be um, considered a sacrifice. Now, again, this takes a little bit of background. In the Roman Catholic view of communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, what is happening is that when the priest stands there and he's got the, the bread and the wine and he pronounces the words, this is my body broken for you, and he then lifts that host, that, that lifting of that host and demonstrating of that host to the church is recreating in current time and history the moment Christ was raised on the cross. And the substance of that wafer, that bread, changes to the actual substance of the physical body of Christ that was on that cross and had died. It is not re-crucifying Christ. It is bringing into the contemporary time the sacrifice that happened, and it rehearses, it brings back into reality at that moment that sacrifice for the people. And the same thing with the blood. And because it is the actual body and is the actual blood of Christ, according to Roman Catholic theology, even though it still maintains the outward appearance of bread and outward, it is now to an, an, an object to be worshipped and adored. If you've ever been to a Roman Catholic church and you walk in, the Catholics, they'll dip their fingers in this little jug of water, this little, you know, ornate marble gold, you know, something that could feed hungry people. Instead, they, you know, put water in it and, and they, they cross themselves. Well, they do so facing this little altar that is on the actual stage altar where the priest is. Inside of that is the the bread that was consecrated from previous masses that was not consumed by the people at that mass. You can't just throw it away. It's the body of Christ, and so it gets a special house. It, that term has an actual theological term in the Roman Catholic Church. It is adoration of the Eucharist. Now, Henry and, and Cranmer did not want this idea of the real presence of Christ and the real sacrifice of Christ to continue, nor did they want the adoration. But at the same time, they did not want it being the real absence of Christ. So, so there's a, there's a, a contrasting uh, theological position that instead of affirming what the point of communion is, it simply affirms that the body and blood of Christ is in no way present in the cup and the host. That's sometimes derogatorily called the real absence of Christ. So uh, they didn't want to go that far either. What they, were, they, they almost had the Lutheran view of, of uh, consubstantiation, but the Lutherans would hate that term. Where the, and it's more than spiritual presence. It's that the presence of God is there in, above, below, and throughout, I think is the, the four words that they used. So uh, this 1549 version, the, the thing that changed was it did not deny the presence of Christ in the communion, but it did not affirm it, but they definitely did not want you adoring it. When you received communion, you still knelt. 
And the communion wasn't put into the hand of the congregant. It was put directly into the mouth of the congregant so you wouldn't tarnish it. So there was still this, you know, extra holiness of the hands of the priest who was, you know, doling out the bread and the wine. In fact, they still only had communion in one part. The ultraquist contra, quist controversy had not yet made its way into England, which is communion in both parts, bread and wine. So, so this is the, the thing that's happening. The, the, the Book of Common Prayer of 1549 is 98% Catholic without the Lord's Supper being a sacrifice. It looked, smelled, tasted. The altars were still stone altars. The priestly vestments still matched the Roman Catholic priestly vestments. It was a change, but it wasn't enough change. And you can imagine if you are picking up your Bible and you're reading and you're getting the, the tracts from Luther and the tracts from John Calvin and you hear about what's happening in Scotland under John Knox, that the fire in your heart for pure worship is not satisfied by this form of worship that's happening. This is the birth of the Puritan movement, right? People wanted the, the reformations in England to go further than they were going and faster than they were going. Well, in 1552, the Book of Common Prayer was revised to, to reflect uh, a, a more reformed theology. The, the stone altars went away and the communion table came into presence, right? The, the um, uh, priests changed from having the, the, the full Roman robes to just the white tunic with the, um, you know, uh, the beauty sash, you know, Miss Universe or whatever they put on there. So, um, now Edward VI dies, and Mary assumes the throne. Uh, she is as Catholic as Catholic can be. She was known as Bloody Mary. Uh, she burned Thomas Cranmer at the stake uh, in March 1556. Now interesting, just a, a brief aside about Thomas Cranmer. He put together this book of common prayer. He was the chief architect. He had help. But he, he aggregated it, right, out of all these other forms of worship and liturgies, a brilliant, brilliant man. And he was, after Mary came to the throne, he was uh, locked into the Tower of London and he was uh, denied every kind of human dignity around. He was tortured. He was deprived of food and light and, and given no hope and, and asked to repent of his reformed ways, and he refused. And then one day they said, you know, this isn't working. The chief uh, theological minister under Henry and Edward is a thorn in our Roman Catholic side. We would love to get him to repent of his Protestantism and get him back on the Roman Catholic side. So they brought him out of the Tower of London and brought him to a beautiful home with a garden let him bathe and eat good food and talk nicely to him and, and told him, you remember how great things were back when you were this important bishop and, and you could be all of those things again, you know. All you, all you need to do is sign this little piece of paper that confesses that you were wrong and that, you know, the Roman... Ca and he broke. And he repented of his Protestant confessions and beliefs. Uh, and then he started seeing his friends being burned at the stake for their Protestantism, and he realized he had made a tragic mistake. And so he repented of his repentance. And he said, I was wrong to have uh, revoked my belief in God and scriptures, the ultimate scripture. And he, he basically said, when you take me to, because they were going to burn him at the stake even after he had um, gone back to Roman Catholicism. They just wanted the piece of paper with his name on it so that they could use that to tell the kingdom, you see, we were right all along with our Roman Catholic Church. And oh, by the way, your date at the stake is still set for 21 March, 1556. He's like, well, if I'm going to get burned at the stake, I'm at least going to go down believing what's true. And so his request was that the hand that signed that paper, renouncing Protestantism, be the first part of his body that got burned up. 
And that's what he did. When they lit that fire, he put his hand in until it was fully immolated by the flames before he went in. And he did so confessing that this hand sinned against God and against man and, you know, and, and made a public demonstration of it. So understand this wasn't just a cold process of you know, passing laws and books. There were real people. And it's like Bible translation. We talk about this one came along and you know, this guy translated it into English and you miss a lot of the, uh, what happened and the, what it cost. And you can devalue uh, what you have if you don't understand the sacrifice that was made by many people to get there. Well, anyhow, Mary dies, and Elizabeth uh, accedes, ascends, she, she becomes queen. Um, and 1559, she desires to have a book of common prayer um, that is a middle way. Now, um, what she did was she changed the language where she kept in the liturgy the part that says, this is the body of Christ. But she also kept in the liturgy the part that is, do this in remembrance of me. Both of which are biblical. But under the Roman Catholic version, the remembrance part was taken out. And only the body of Christ part was left in. Under the more reformed part, only the, the remembrance part was kept in. And so she puts in both places. She's like, well, I want to have all the words so that whatever the people want to believe, they can believe, right? And we'll make it easier for everybody. It was this middle way. And then a few years later in 1571, there was and something I hadn't mentioned yet, but as we, as we looked at the Protestant Reformation on the continent, one of the things that uh, became important was to have a defined um, statement of faith. Remember the Marburg Colloquy? They brought together John Calvin and Martin, I'm sorry, um, uh, Ulrich Wingley and Martin Luther to say, this is what we believe as, you know, these reformed Protestants. Even though Luther's Lutheran and Zwingli is, uh, you know, Swiss reformed, they agreed on 15 or 14.8 out of 15 points. You know, the, the this is hocus corpus meum was the one sticking point with the Lutherans, the, you know, about the presence of Christ in the communion. Well, they had no statement of faith in England. You had to kind of figure out what they were trying to believe by looking at the liturgy, as I mentioned earlier in the lesson. Well, in 1571, they finally get to the point when they're like, because of this middle way and the lack of clarity about where do we land on Reformed theology and Roman Catholic theology and Lutheran theology, where do we as Anglicans actually land? And so in 1571, and I, I printed out for you the version of the 39 articles from 1801. I believe it was 1801. So you can go through and read it. And basically it breaks down into about eight sections. What do we believe about God? What do we believe about the Bible? What do we believe about uh, worship about the you know authority of the king and and so it, it's interesting to see that happen. Well, what happens in 1603? Elizabeth, who's now she's reigned for what 50 years, right? 1558 to 1603, so nearly 50 years. This is you know a, a good peace in England been made over this. But because she has still got so much of the Roman Catholicism in the uh, Anglican church, her successor is coming from Scotland. James VI of Scotland was an itty-bitty baby boy when he became the king in Scotland. And much like Edward VI had Thomas Cranmer as his primary tutor, James the sixth had John Knox, who is uh, ultra reformed. Uh, Scottish Presbyterianism has their, you know, ancestral roots. That flag is firmly planted in the the, the teaching of John Knox, and we're going to look at him at some point. An incredible story, unbelievable impact on Christendom. 
and an important impact on the development of the Puritans because they looked to him like, um, like the rebellion in Star Wars looked to Luke Skywalker, right? Like you are our, our only hope, or Obi-Wan, right? You are our only hope. Here comes James the Sixth, a young man who is raised up and very, very reformed, coming down to be the king now over England. And the Puritans... They gather together, they sign a document, and before he's even the king, he's like on his way to get whatever they do, uh, you know, omni domni hocus copus de pluribus unum, you're the king, right? And they give him this document called the millinery document that, hey, while you're the king, fix all of these things that are wrong with the Church of England. That's this millinery petition. One of the problems they had was that in... Scotland, the king was the king. But the presbytery of the church told the king what to do and how to behave and what he could and could not do. When he got to England, it was the king was the king. He called the, the, the uh, legislature together. He told the legislature what was, he told the bishops what to do. And here you've got the Puritans saying, hey, we want you to give up some of this newfound power as the king so that you can make the church more churchy, more biblical. And he's like, yeah, I kind of like this king thing a lot more in England than I did in Scotland. So James the sixth of Scotland becomes James the first, and he's got to solve this riddle. Now, he was brilliant and theologically minded. He was, you know, a very wise man. I don't want to, you know, put it off as if his only concern was, you know, his own personal opulence, which was very much the case. His own personal affinity for sexual relations with young men, which was very much true of him, right? He, he was, he was a, a, a dastardly man in a lot of ways. You know, find me the perfect man, uh, and I'll tell you, unless you found me Christ, you have not found the perfect man. He did wonderful things, but he had his proclivities, right? Uh, one of his opponents said, uh, England has lost her king and gained her queen when he came to the throne, right? And so in response, James I had his head cut off and uh, embalmed and sent to this guy's wife, right, as, as a, a prize. So... Uh, we'll get into that story much later on too. So church history is fun, by the way. If, if you haven't caught on, there's a whole lot that happens. Well, he calls together this thing called the Hampton Court Conference. And what he wants to do is he wants to meet with the bishops of the Anglican Church and find out, uh, you know, what is the, the way forward with the Book of Common Prayer. And he meets with the Puritans. This is that same conference when when the decision was made that one of the things we can do to kind of ameliorate the problems that we're having is quit letting the Puritans use the Geneva Bible with all the Reformed theology in the footnotes and start using the same Bible that the Church of England was using. The Church of England was using um, It was the Bishop's Bible, the Great Bible, but it, it went back to the English translation of Tyndale. And the Puritans did not like a lot of the choices that were made in that Bible. So he says, well, one thing we can do is we can come up with our own translation of the Bible that everybody will agree on. I'll put scholars from the Puritans together with scholars from the Church of England, and they can all make their own translation. This we today know as the King James Bible, right? It was there to try to settle these disputes. Well, one of the other things that came, and it wasn't finished till 1611, uh, one, of, one of the other things that came out of it was the 1604 Book of Common Prayer. But the Book of Common Prayer still required the congregation to kneel when they received communion, indicating some sort of adoration of the communion. It still required babies to be baptized to purify them of original sin, this idea of baptismal regeneration, which the, you know, was strongly 
strongly rejected by the Puritans and eventually would get to the point when a group of Puritans just decided we're never going to make the change that we believe is necessary and so we are going to separate from the Church of England. Well, why is that a problem? Remember the characteristics of the Book of Common Prayer that we talked about earlier, what that last characteristic was? Mandatory, right? Remember, remember that whole uh, punishable by 40 pounds or 10 pounds to life imprisonment to forfeiture of all po- uh, property part? All that's still on the books. And so if you're going to separate over these things, you're going to separate with some really dire consequences to you. And you're not going to be able to stay in England for very long. And that's exactly where this this Baptist movement that we know of, that, you know, this guy John Smith, we're going to smite, we're going to talk about, leaves for Amsterdam, still believing in baby baptism, right? And meets with the Anabaptists who are there, Mino Simons and their group, right? And, and, And learns to read scripture through a lens other than his historical background, his Anglican background, and see the words for, you know, what they're telling him, which was all new to him, and says, well, we've been wrong about baptism all along. Now, he didn't immerse people. He still, you know, poured water over his head and then poured water over 42 other guys' heads. And then he gets involved even with another Anabaptist congregation, and they baptized by immersion. And so him and the guy he was with, they split. He stays. John Smythe stays. The guy he's with, the lawyer he's with, goes back to England, forms the London Baptist Confession, and, and, and that's a whole different story. But you can see how the, the Book of Common Prayer, about the, what the theology is being communicated through the way the practice is, is going to create a rigid denominational differences that that are not going to be, because if there is a difference, if there is separation, if there is variety, if there's a lack of unity, that must mean the monarch is not legitimate, right? Some worship after Cephas or Apollos or, you know, even Christ, right? They, They try to put the name of the person in charge as the substance of why they're unified rather than looking at the sacrifice of Christ as the purpose for unity. So that's all I have for this week. Next time, Christianity in South America with Andy Williams. And then when we get back together, we're going to take a look at this character, John Knox, right? We're going to pick up another one of these threads. We're going to look at what happened with him and how he impacted Christianity in Scotland. And then we'll be able to put that piece more uh, firmly together with the English uh, Reformation. Questions? It is, in fact, 1979, I believe, is the most current revision of the Book of Common Prayer. And, and, and f- that's a wonderful point. When you go to a wedding and you hear, Dearly beloved, we are gathered together today, that comes, that language is directly out of the Book of Common Prayer. When you go to a funeral and you hear, Ashes to ashes and dust to dust, Book of Common Prayer. I mean, th- those things are exactly where they, our whole wedding ceremony is basically just plagiarized out of the Book of Common Prayer. So it's extremely important, even if it didn't exist as a printing, the legacy of it, very much so. In American Episcopalians. So the significant difference between the Episcopalian Church in America and the Anglican Church in England is the... Uh, profession of loyalty to the monarch. It would not do for Episcopalians to uh, have the king or queen of England be the head of the church in America. (laughs) Right? You can see the conflict there. Right? So they have their own bishopric structure, and they still share um, the bishop of, Archbishop of Canterbury, but the, the, the head of the church being the defender of the faith, the governor of the church, that is not king. No. Now, there is no government connection in the U.S. That, that, uh, that division is, I think, firmly established here. Excellent question. 
Any other questions? All right, we'll see you in about a half hour then.